Hi, welcome to Distinti's World number 19. This is the UFO question, part two. In part one, we discussed the U.S. policy toward UFOs, and we said that their policy has to be a deny policy and a cover-up policy. And I said to you in that previous episode that that makes sense. That's what they must do. That's the right tactical decision to make assuming you do not know what the aliens are about. That is the best thing to do. And it also showed a potential inadvertent admission by the U.S. government in the form of a release of uh, combat footage. Well, I don't want to call it combat footage, but footage of combat aircraft tracking UFOs. And it's not so much that they're tracking the UFOs, is that they have the capability to track things that move faster than any other kind of aircraft known to man. So why would you develop that kind of, of capability unless you were actively uh, collecting intelligence about these UFOs? And I talked about my experiences, and you can go back to that video to see them. And the SETI evidence, which I outlined, is not really evidence by SETI, it's evidence by cosmologists. And then I touched on some other possible theories, like that they're benevolent and they have a, um, you know, they have a non-interference policy like the prime directive from Star Trek. Okay, uh, in this part, I will discuss the most logical theory that fits what limited information that we have. Okay, and these are the observations that I'm, I'm going to go by. First of all, they're here. Let's just say that that's a fact that they're here. And so far, we haven't seen anything in toward hostility. Um, they haven't tried to invade. They haven't tried to kill people, as far as we know. I mean, they even go out of their way that when they take people, abduct people, they go out of their way to return them with as little uh, trauma as possible, wiping their memory, you know, putting them back in their car, so on and so forth. So, I mean, consider us when we go and study wild animals and we tag them and spray paint big numbers on their sides, uh, we don't go through the trouble of, you know, bringing them back to where we got them from. We just dump them off wherever we're done processing them, you know, with a big number painted on their side and a big, you know, radio collar or a big tag in the rear. So, and we don't bother wiping their memory. Not, not I don't even think if we knew how we would. Okay, so they seem to be more benevolent about studying us than we do about studying what we consider inferior creatures. And they've gone out of their way to remain incognito. Then they recover evidence. Like, for example, in the Roswell crash, it's been my theory, and I've stated this in a number of previous videos, that the U.S. government isn't covering up the evidence from the Roswell crash. The, the stupid U.S. government put the evidence on an aircraft to fly it from Roswell to the Air Force Base in Texas. Now, any good alien would probably just intercept the, cra the craft in mid-flight and replace the, recover their technology and replace it with uh, weather balloon material. And the reason why I say that is because Roswell happened in 1947 America. Okay, the United States developed the atomic bomb in like 1945, they finished it. But the United States government could not keep the atomic bomb plan secret. If they couldn't keep atomic bomb plan secret, what the hell would make anyone think they could keep a, USO, a UFO cover-up going? Okay, I'm sorry. The U.S. government is, for, for the most part, incompetent. And that's good, I think. I'm not saying that's bad. I think, you know, the government was actually designed to be incompetent. If they're doing this, then they got more competence than I know about. Okay. Okay, and they seem to be helping us in subtle ways. Okay, for I have many, 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 many examples I could go over of things in history that should not have gone the way they went. Okay, but one of them, the one that stands most in my memory, is the Cold War. There were many instances where the U.S. and the Soviet Union were at the point of launching missiles at each other, and something stopped it. Okay, and there's even, uh, what do you call it, missile silo people that have come forward and said, yeah, aliens would fly over, or UFOs would fly over, and all of a sudden all the missiles would go offline. So it seems like they're helping us in subtle ways. Okay, and I'll explain why that makes sense when you look at the scenario. Okay, in the previous theories that we discussed, is they have a non-interference policy. 
And that doesn't make sense because it seems like they're helping us in very subtle ways, not very direct ways, very subtle ways. And the other theory was the reason why is that, they're, that they haven't made contact with us is because we're too retarded or inferior to them. Okay, and that doesn't make sense because why would they then go out of their way to to take the trauma out of the things that happen? Why do they bother wiping the memories of people they abduct to study? I mean, if they just wanted to abduct us to study us, why even return us if they think of us as an inferior species, like the way we would, you know, take samples of biological specimens of other planets and bring them back to Earth? Maybe they have. We just don't. Maybe that's who some of the missing persons are. Okay, and it seems to me that they need us to succeed. And this is where the major part of my scenario comes in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain their scenario by first starting with, let's start with a scenario on Earth so I can speak of things in terms that you will understand. So let's say that the Hawaiian Islands, okay, are cut off from the rest of the world somehow. In other words, they're all alone now for whatever reason. This is a hypothetical situation. Okay, so that means that all of the technology they have is all they're ever going to get. Okay, in other words, they probably don't have to, uh, semiconductor manufacturing technology on any of the islands. They probably certainly don't have the ability to mine and refine silicon. Uh, they probably don't have any oil. Maybe they have a couple oil derricks that are old and they get some oil going. But for the most part, whatever technology they have as far as shipbuilding, ships, um, aircraft, cars, cell phones, computers, and all that stuff, whatever technology they have is only going to be stuff they're going to have forever and ever. And they're going to have to probably go out of their way to keep that technology going. Okay, so they're cut off from the rest of the world and they don't have the ability to replenish certain things. So... What were they going to do? Well, let's take this scenario one step further. Let's say we took these islands and they were swept onto another planet where the rest of the world of that other planet was back in 1900s Earth. It's an alien species, but they're back in 1900s technology. So to the people of that world, the technology, if they were able to see the technology that the Hawaiian people had, then they would see, oh, wow, this modern cell phones and modern cars and aircraft and ships. And we're assuming that, you know, Oahu still has a significant military force. So there's military type jets and helicopters and stuff like that that are still available to the cut off Hawaiians. So what would the Hawaiians do? What would the, what would the humans do in this scenario? Well, first of all, they probably try to go out of their way to prevent those other species from recognizing that they now exist on their planet. Okay, because they don't want all these people coming in and like, you know, flooding them in. Oh, oh, they've got advanced medical technology. These people, the humans would be overwhelmed with people coming for to solve my boo-boo, fix my broken leg. And and so they, and then people are going to overblow the technology out of proportion. They're going to seem like gods to the people of the rest of the world. And because they're going to seem like gods, everybody's going to be swarming onto these islands and saying, oh, please, oh, God, and it's, going to, it's just going to totally destroy the society. It could potentially destroy the rest of society. So it's important for them to keep out of the way and keep quiet. And the other thing that now, but what's good now is because this other species has 1900s technology, they can at least get oil from an other things that were mined out of mines like uh, copper for wire and stuff like that. They don't have plastics technology, but hey, you know, maybe we could send infiltrators on to kind of give the idea and hint to people about plastics and about semiconductors and about electronics and about flight. Because if we can get the other species to evolve a little bit faster to the point that we can get them to the point where they can start supplying us with the technology we need to retain our you know, our life, our, our standard of living and be able to, you know, keep us going the way we were, then we're going to try help pushing them along so that we can get back up to that, them up to the technology where then, you know, you know, we can coexist possibly. Okay, so let's now take that out of this scenario and put it into a star system scenario. So this is a, I just pulled off this map from the internet. This is a map of a star. United Federations or early early Star Trek game or whatever. 
So let's assume that here's like, you know, the, you know, the, okay, there it goes. You know, this would be, let's say the earth society here. This would be like all the archipelago worlds of earth. And this would be all the archipelago earths of, let's say the Vulcan, but let's just not talk in terms of Star Trek. Let's just say that there's only one advanced society that is spacefaring, okay? And the main planets that provide the technology somehow get destroyed. Let's say uh, a virus, a plague, or something that explodes, like a, a black hole explodes. And so all you have left are the outlining worlds, which are just basically colonies, like as, as Hawaii would be to the United States or the rest of the world. And so now you have all these planets that do not have the technology to replace. They cannot, cannot replace the technology they have. But then they notice that this other species over here on this planet is evolving and they're only a couple hundred years behind. So what do you think they're gonna do? They're going to go and help out that other inferior race, make sure that that other inferior race doesn't make big mistakes like nuke itself. And so they're going to act like a parent species. And just like a parent, they can't go tell the, the junior species what to do. They can kind of nudge them a little bit, but they can't tell them what to do. Because think about a parent. When you're a kid, your parent trying to tell you what to do. And you're like, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, mom, you don't know what you're talking about, blah, 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 blah. You know how many times kids and parents have had these experiences. And the parents are very smart and they know, okay, they just got to sh sh shake their head and say, you know, realize that, you know, they were young too, and they just have to make the mistake on their own. Okay, and so what they're going to do, they're going to let us make the mistakes. They may nudge us a little bit, and they may prevent us from making a really, really bad mistake, like, for example, preventing a nuclear war from happening, because they need us to survive. And, you know, it's in their best interest we survive, so that they can regain their technology by helping us gain the technology. Because, you know, again, their infrastructure is destroyed and they don't have the means to go replace that technology. But here you got this entire world of billions of people with mining and all the, the, the mathematics and the computers will eventually be developed. And so they need us to survive so that they can recover or get replacements for their technology eventually when we get there. Okay, and again, they're going to act like a parental race. They're going to be benevolent, but they're going to let us make the mistakes on our own, but they're just not going to let us make really bad mistakes, like nuking ourselves. So that's my theory. And I think that theory is equally capable, because what, what if the world had a nuclear war and wiped out everything again, except the Hawaiian Islands? It puts you in that situation. What's Hawaii? What, what are the people left on Hawaii going to do? Let's assume the radiation isn't going to swarm over the world and kill everybody. And let's say that, you know, just the Hawaiian islands, the people on Hawaii survive. They're going to be in that same situation where they're going to be technologi technologically stranded. Okay. And so, it, you know, that's, that's what they're going to have to do. And then somehow they're going to have to recreate the technology, but they're not going to have, you know, how many people did it take to learn how to make semiconductors? You know, all the different companies that were trying little things at the time, the people around the world, all improving little piece here and a little piece there and a little piece there. How many, you know, billions of people it takes just to get semiconductors going. So anyway, that's my theory. I'd like to know what you think. And um, yeah. Let me stop this. There are a number of ways to support us. You could go to the distinti.com website, which is a repository of uh, all the papers that have been published. And it kind of puts all of the videos on YouTube into a nice order. The, it also gives more information who I am. Uh, it's free. There's no, nothing to sign up on it. Some of the videos might be for Patreon only, but and that'll be on the Patreon site. And the Patreon site is ethereummechanics.com. And we have lots of levels of support. You can be a, just a supporter. You can be a first class passenger, a regular passenger, an engineer or a bridge officer. Each has different uh, levels of support. Like for example, if you are engineer, you get 
access to all the source code that's produced for all these animations uh, and the simulations. If you're a first class passenger, you get access to any executables and any PDFs and spreadsheets that are produced. Uh, regular passengers just have access to the technology videos. There are other videos that are administrative, which are for bridge officers only and they're more administrative. Uh, the supporter just gives a few dollars up to you know two to nine dollars a month to support the effort uh, and there are notifications only that of what the status is what we're working on and any public videos that are produced and there are public posts also that the uh, supporter would be made aware of um, the other alternative is the ethereummechanics.info which is our blog site this is managed by sebastian it's a good balance between the two if you don't want to it, it It'll give good indicator when we um, new videos are released on the YouTube and or the Patreon site. And there's people discussing uh, certain things like how to make a gravity detector and all that stuff. Right now, I'm in the process of completing the electrogravity paper, which hopefully should be complete by summer 2020. After I'm done there, it'll be a big load off my plate and I can get back into more actively taking care of you know people's uh, questions and emails and doing a little bit more on the blog site so those are the th oh and, and if you just want to give a one-time donation you can go to distinti.com and there is a donate you to a paypal donate button you can do that as well okay and if you really want to understand what we're going to the, on the youtube site there is the playlist for the channel trailers there's like i think 13 channel trailers which cover everything from what i'm doing to faster than light starships that Quantum entanglement is ridiculous. The particle wave duality is also ridiculous. Um, uh, and, and the discussion of quantum computers and all that stuff. Basically, a general overview of the things that I talk about, get into. This Distinti's World videos, again, is more for uh, odd things that are unrelated to ethereal mechanics. But this UFO kind of is because I do believe that faster than light starships are possible. And that's the main gist of my channel to develop the technology that'll carry us to the stars because again as i said in the t1 video that i introduced the previous slide if we do not develop faster than light starships we are pretty much dead and you can watch the t1 trailer for that and the t3 trailer also gets into how i came up with the number of what the sustainable capacity of the earth is anyway thank you very much and i'll put the links for all those for a lot of the videos in the low bar of this video. Thank you.